Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's uh, begin, please. Uh, I'm really delighted to, inv uh, to welcome you uh, this evening to the Faculty of Population Health Sciences first alumni event. Now, there are, I think, in the audience, a mixture of uh, alumni, people who graduated from UCL, from the faculty, uh, um, some staff I'm pleased to see, some postdocs, some current students, uh, and members of, of the public. And, and you're all very welcome to tonight. My name is Graham Hart. I'm Dean of the Faculty of Population Health Sciences, uh, and very fortunate indeed to, uh, to uh, run a, a really uh, large, uh, research-driven, uh, but also uh, teaching-based uh, faculty. We have seven institutes in the faculty, the Great Ormond Street Institute for Child Health, the um, uh, Institute for Women's Health, the Institute of Epidemiology and Healthcare, and Institutes of Health Informatics, Cardiovascular Science, Global Health, and Clinical Trials and Methodology. So unsurprisingly, we style ourselves as the life course, as UCL's life course uh, faculty, because we elucidate, elucidate the biological, uh, the behavioral, the psychosocial uh, processes that operate across an individual's life, uh, lifetime and uh, across generations that affect the development of health and disease. And, and this is the research that informs our undergraduate, uh, our postgraduate, uh, and vocational teaching. And it's perhaps because of that very wide range of science, uh, we uh, generate nearly a quarter of all UCL's research income. So uh, we're very successful faculty in terms of uh, our research outputs and of course the impacts that they have uh, on human health. So uh, it's, it's really lovely to see you all this evening. Very pleased that you've, you've come along this, this, this Friday. There's a further opportunity to actually uh, meet uh, together. Uh, we're going over to the pavilion on the other side of uh, Gower Street uh, for some drinks and, and canapes. Uh, and I hope that you'll join us uh, for, for that. Um, but the main point of this evening is uh, to hear from uh, Dr. Zand uh, van Tuleken, uh, who's uh, very kindly, in a sense, come back to the faculty, uh, having been a, a teacher uh, and lecturer uh, uh, in the Institute of, of Global Health on uh, humanitarian issues. Um, but many of you will know Zand uh, from his um, subsequent uh, very successful career uh, uh, as a as a TV star, uh, Ouch Operation, right. I believe is the, right. is the, is the uh, children's show, Operation Ouch. No, that's, that's good, that's good. It was only that's good. today I learned it was the CBBC to see, to see this, so Operation Ouch. Uh, but also uh, popular science programs, Horizon, uh, he's got a, a new book out on how to lose weight well, I should read this. Um, <laughs> and a company Channel 4 series. Uh, it's, you know, this is a uh, renaissance man, I think. We're very fortunate uh, to, to have him uh, 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 visiting this evening uh, and uh, talking about his work. But the work that he's going to be talking about is actually um, uh, uh, another side of his whole life, which is uh, working in humanitarian uh, with humanitarian problems uh, in conflict areas of, of, of the world. Um, he's going to talk about the refugee crisis in uh, Europe and some of the difficulties and, and compromises associated with the humanitarian response to that. So uh, please give a very warm round of applause to Dr. Zand. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I feel like George Osborne has sort of ruined the idea of a Renaissance man for everybody. Um, well, there are a huge number of things you could be doing on, in London 
on a Friday night. And I think it is, um, I'm very pleased that you've come to listen to me talk, but the idea that you would take time out of your days and lives to think about refugees and um, discuss that uh, to me is extremely impressive that we can fill a room in London on a Friday night to talk about this. Um, so I hope uh, what I'm going to try and do is talk around the idea of refugees and humanitarian responses for about 30, 35 minutes, something like that, and give us sort of flavour of the kind of things that I think would be interesting, and then we'll throw it into questions. And if there aren't any questions, I'll just keep talking until the canapes are ready, and then we can go and do that. Um, so um, I, I'm going to begin uh, with this sort of the, the, the only moment where I've been able to merge my 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 television career, which is quite ridiculous. I, I'm. I'm a professional fool on children's television, if any of you have sort of eight to 12 year olds. Um, but I managed to get the BBC to do um, one uh, program on humanitarianism, which, which, uh, which my brother and I took part in. And um, the reason I say is it, it merged is because um, we got a lot of access to different sites through an organization called Doctors of the World UK. And I'm on the board of, uh, of that um, NGO. That they're, they're a bit, I, I, they're, they're like MSF. And in fact, they're so much like MSF that they were founded by Bernard Kushner, who founded MSF. They almost sort of were, were a splinter group. So you can think of them as that kind of large, international, multi-million dollar organization based in France with a UK branch. And um, I've worked for them in several different places, mainly in, mainly in Sudan. I've worked, worked for them twice in Sudan. And so I have a great deal of affection for um, for this organization and since I have no institutional affiliation currently other than them um, as I've just moved back to London that's that's the that's thus the background for the slide so um, I'm gonna boldly push a button here and see if this makes it easier to see mm, doesn't see oh is that a bit easier to see I might go even bolder is that, yeah that is that is better isn't it? in January last year uh, we travelled to Lesbos, I say we, my brother and I and a, and a film crew travelled to Lesbos to try and get a sense of what was happening, um, where people were coming from, what the experience was like of crossing the ocean from Turkey to Greece and then what their journey was. And so we met refugees, um, migrants in Lesbos and then travelled not with particular ones but made parts of the journey and met people arriving at each stage through Europe. Um, in Greece, and then in Serbia, then in Germany, and then finally in France. And um, it was so extraordinary to me that it was possible to stand on a beach in Europe and for the first time have the sense of being some kind of international aid worker, that, that same feeling, and yet to be doing it in territory which very, very much felt like home. I think Greece feels like the heart of Europe in many ways historically, and certainly you know, I've been on holidays to Greece, my brother and his wife have been on holidays to Greece, and to be standing on that island, on that beach, um, saying welcome to Europe, to people who didn't necessarily need much help, was a very peculiar experience. To give you a sense of what was happening, um, and we can talk in questions, if you, it's very hard to, to tell the whole story of the migration crisis um, quickly, but to give you a sense of what was happening, um, the Arab Spring opened up an opportunity for people smuggling with the collapse of Libya, moving people across the Med to Lampedusa. And Europe had, if you like, a, a vulnerability, depending on your politics, maybe a vulnerability to large quantities of immigration because of the Schengen Agreement, which meant, means once you're in Europe, there really aren't many border controls. Um, and so about 50,000 people had arrived over the course of less than a year through Lampedusa into Italy. And the Italians were pretty relaxed about registering them, but that had become very politically uncomfortable because of the large numbers of people dying in the Med. So that is part of it. The, the Arab Spring, the collapse of Libya, had opened up almost, if you like, an expertise in how to seduce people into moving out of the Sahel, out of northern Africa, and into Europe, and a, a, a knowledge among the people smugglers of how to, how to find the ways in, how to, how to get people into Europe. Um, and then with the war in Syria, there was a moment where very, very large numbers of people who were in Turkey, so in, 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 it were building, large numbers of Syrians are building up in Turkey, and there is a moment where the European Court of Human Rights hears a case of an Afghan refugee who has got to Belgium, having registered in Greece, and the Dublin Agreement says, if you register in Greece, you stay in Greece. And he gets to Belgium and he says, the Greek, Greek economy is collapsing, uh, it will be... 
Um, they will not be able to support me as a refugee if I go back to Greece. And so the European Court of Human Rights hears his case and decides that's right, he can stay in Belgium. And at that moment then, the, there is a knowledge among a small group of people that there is a possibility that you will be allowed to move through Europe. And so then we have this opportunity where the refugees have some, or the people who want to leave Syria have some of this knowledge, the refugees in Turkey have some of this knowledge, and the people smugglers are very, very rapidly um, disseminating this knowledge. So we can go into more detail about any of that, but you can get a picture that Europe has, has altered through its pre-existing laws, and then through subsequent legal decisions, a moment is created um, that exactly coincides with a massive displacement of people in Syria. Half the Syrian population, 10 million people are displaced, and 4 million of those leave the country around 2015. So this picture is the engines from two days on one Greek island that are captured from the boats coming on shore. And that was maybe the most striking, more than anything else, that was the most striking representation of just how vast the business of people smuggling was. So if you get through Europe, you could get to Calais or Dunkirk. And I'm putting these pictures up just to give you, um, if I start with this nice picture of Justin Bieber there, that's why I've included that, Friday night. Um, you get a sense, if you can think for a moment, this is January in Calais. Northern Europe, if, if you speak to soldiers, Northern Europe is the very, very worst climate to fight in because it's damp and it's cold. If you're in Sweden, it's cold and dry, so you can keep warm. But in this, in this climate, you get trench foot, and you get terrible respiratory illness from trying to keep warm. So, if you look at the conditions in that picture and try and imagine what it's like at minus two, minus four that day, ice, cr cr mud crunching with ice underfoot, these are the kind of conditions that people were living in in France less than two years ago. And I, I, if you can make out the vast quantities of mud and general disgustingness. And if you look at the floor here, the, those first two are in Dunkirk. This is in Calais in the camp. I know I'm skipping around a bit, but we'll, we'll tie it all together. Um, that is a frozen pond of human excrement, human waste, and um, rotting food. And the quantity of rats, and um, uh, r mainly rats actually, living on this, the general levels of hygiene were absolutely appalling. So. Uh, this is a picture of shoes outside a family's tent in Dunkirk. And I think you get, for me, that was, I, I, if you've ever been camping and had that kind of nasty, like, don't get the shoes in the tent feeling, this was the, the worst case of this I've ever seen. And people were living in these conditions for potentially years on end. Um, you can see here, peculiarly, two sides of salmon that have been abandoned. Um, there were a lot of people in, in, the, in the camps who'd come to volunteer, and um, someone had come via Waitrose, uh, filled their boot with a lot of fresh salmon and driven it to the camp, which is sort of an extraordinary thing. I mean, how nice to have some fresh salmon in the middle of a camp in, in Europe, but on the other hand, um, it had been abandoned pretty rapidly. So uh, there were no refrigeration facilities in the tents or anything. So um, the other thing that you can get a sense of clearly, this is just really looking at the ground, is um, uh, other clues to life. These are abandoned CS gas um, canisters uh, from Calais. This is not, I, I know there's a tradition in, in sort of this kind of photograph of arranging everything the way you want it. This is just a snapshot of the ground as, as I found it. Um, every night the police would just sort of shell gas canisters into the camp um, as a sort of low level attritional making life in the jungle in Calais less pleasant. Um, it's very interesting if you go to PubMed and try and find out is CS gas bad for you, most of the time, uh, most of the reports, so, so um, uh, the striking statistic to me is that no one has ever won a lawsuit against any police force in the world for health damage from CS gas unless they've been hit by the canister. So it is regarded as being safe by the police forces. They've never been sued or punished for using it because they're using it usually on mobile populations of young people who come out to protest or, or riot or however you want to characterise those kind of places where CS gas is used. And they get a bit of gas and they run away and go home. But if you're shelling a camp full of women and children and vulnerable people day after day who've got high levels of respiratory illness, who are a bit malnourished, who are highly stressed, whose immune systems are not working very well, you start to get very, very unpleasant effects. So normally, pregnant people are not at CS gas rallies or riots or protests. Um, but the, uh, both those camps had lots of pregnant people in them and lots of young children 
um, and lots of elderly people. And so populations that are not typically CS gassed at all were being gassed on a daily basis. We have no um, knowledge of the public health consequences of that, but we could imagine, has anyone here been CS gassed? It's, it, it's horrible, right? I mean, I was appalled. I, I, I was amazed that we think this stuff is safe. Um, it's like chemical warfare. I mean, it was really, really brutal. And so it was very, it was very frightening and unpleasant when it happens. And um, it probably is not doing you any good if you're pregnant. It doesn't feel like it is. Uh, dead rats all over the place as well. So a level of kind of disgustingness and appallingness in northern modern Europe. In a good, you know, in France, not in Greece, you know, uh, uh, with, a, with, a, with a, a decent economy that could afford to do better. And this is the MDM clinic. Um, we can roughly, roughly translate the, you know, the, the politics of illness, um, stopping the politics of illness. So we have moments in migration where people are rendered extremely vulnerable because of the journeys they've been forced to take or have decided to take. And that is what drives the logic of modern humanitarianism. And so I wanted to um, go back just step back a bit and kind of think about how we have arrived at the humanitarian practices that we typically see. Um, this is a picture of a Red Cross vehicle. The Red Cross are really the original humanitarian organisations. In, in 1845, Henri Dunant witnesses the Battle of Solferino, sees all the suffering and says, wouldn't it be great if there was an organisation that would take care if you were injured, no matter which side you were fighting for? And he sees the nuns looking after them. It should be a, a, a neutral organisation. And the Red Cross is founded, and today um, they are still, they, they run, they operate about $2 billion a year um, doing a, a variety of different things, but they are kind of the original humanitarian organization because of their very, very strict adherence to neutrality, that they do not speak out. They will condemn abuses, but they do it in private, behind closed doors. They do a lot of backroom diplomacy, but they are not in the business of publicly speaking out, unlike, say, an MSF or another kind of NGO. So this is a kind of exact um, destruction of the humanitarian idea. The shell has just landed rather perfectly. The logic of responding to crises in neutral, apolitical ways, which I would imagine lots of people in the room have either, has anyone worked for a humanitarian organisation or done that, kind, engaged in, in some way with those kind of ideas? So you have, um, we, we have a modern logic, certainly among my undergraduates, they wanted to save the world and they want to save the world as part of a neutral humanitarian organisation going and helping people on the basis of need. But this is not always the case. So we've got pictures here of, of um, Hemingway, uh, Byron, Auden and, and, and Orwell, um, all of whom employed a different logic in their attempts to save the world. Hemingway, going and fighting in the Spanish Civil War, the best bathroom selfie ever. If, if <laughs> Tinder had existed, that would have been his picture on it. Um, Hemingway uh, spent most of the war in bed with Martha Gellhorn. I don't think he actually did anything very valuable in terms of fighting. But he picked up a gun and went to fight the fascists. Um, Auden, it's always nice to put a picture of Auden up because he has this totally destroyed face. He said... Um, that his face looked like it had been uh, a wedding cake that had been left in the rain. Um, Hannah Arendt, the, the sort of philosopher of totalitarianism and, and, of, and of evil, um, talks about how his face makes manifold life's invisible, manifest life's invisible furies. Um, Philip Larkin said, oh, no, it was David Hockney said of, of, of Auden's face, um, if that's his face, imagine what his scrotum looks like. Um, it's quite nice. Anyway, it turns out, it turns out he has a very, very rare um, connective tissue disorder, the name of which I'm going to struggle to remember, so it's not quite as hilarious as it all seems. But anyway, he lived a, he lived a long and successful life. Um, so he didn't do, he, le he drove an ambulance for about six weeks, was very embarrassed by it, everyone made fun of him because he's such a bad ambulance driver, so he kind of came home. But he'd gone out to fight the fascists on a side. Um, Orwell, uh, in the top there, uh, got shot very early on, um, got shot in the neck, said he was too tall for trench warfare and came home. And Byron, Byron might have been the first um, Prime Minister of Greece if he hadn't died of malaria. So these are all, they, they all took up swords or arms as part of a cause and went to fight evil actively, um, or at least even in Auden's case, on, you're driving an ambulance, but, but on a side. And there are a tiny number of people who still do this now. There are a handful of Americans who've gone out, and, and a handful, I have to say, of the diaspora community who have gone, I mean, in some cases, to join ISIS, but, but not uncommonly to go and join the Kurdish fighters or to go and join other Syrian rebels um, to try and 
fight what they perceive as the tangible evil. And these people are kind of a laughing stock now. I mean, I have not met in teaching humanitarianism for about, I don't know, 10 years or so now from, is it 10, something like that, must be, must be about that. Um, I've met any undergraduates who are like, yeah, but what if I just took a gun and went and started shooting the bad guys? No one says that anymore. These, these, this New York Times article was amazing because these people were such a laughing stock. They were kind of American militia members who'd gone out and were really doing no good at all. So instead, this is kind of the way we think of humanitarianism now. This sort of hand-wringing, um, uh, a portrayal of innocence, um, a claim that if we were to only help, that would be enough of an intervention. Giorgio Agamben is an Italian philosopher who I reckon distinguishes himself as the most unreadable writer in the world at the moment, in Italian or in translation. Um, but so we can try and make sense of him. He makes it's lovely reading Agamben because it doesn't make any sense at all. So everyone kind of does whatever they want with it. But his his he does one useful thing where he steals some of Hannah Arendt's work, which steals from Heidegger, which I think steals from Aristotle, but he, he kind of frames it very well. And he says, look, there are two kinds of life. There's zoi and bios. One is a way of life, and one is mere existence. So he doesn't exactly coin the phrase bare life, but bare life is sort of a Gambon's idea, that there is just existing a heartbeat, a calorie intake, the use of oxygen, and then there is a correct, a way of life proper to a group of people. And the Greeks have words for it in, the way that we, in a way that we don't. So the claim Agamben makes is that he makes a broader claim about Western society, but that the camp and the refugee camp, the, the camp, and you see on, on, on the cover of his book, do you recognize the image on the cover of his book? What's, does anyone recognize that? I'll show you more clearly. This is the, this is the image here. Um, this is Auschwitz's main camp. His, his claim is that the concentration camp, the extermination camp, has a close parallel with the refugee camp. Now, this seems kind of antithetical, right? That one, one of them is a place where life is extinguished and the other is a place where life is fostered. So it's a very, very provocative claim. And um, he spends a long time making it. What's interesting about it is the way he teases out the history of Auschwitz. The Auschwitz was not put there merely to exterminate people. It was put there because IG Farber a company that still exists now as a subsidiary of a modern German chemical company um, had a latex plant there and they wanted workers. So Auschwitz was a place of extermination, certainly, but a place of the very particular administration of life. Now, this is an overhead picture of Zattery Camp in Jordan. And it's kind of a cheat because they're both black and white aerial photos of organized settlements. But what is, what is striking to you about this picture? What, what I don't, maybe nothing, but does anyone notice anything particular about this picture? Is there anything that's shocking? A picture of Auschwitz. What's the sort of horror that we see here? It's extremely ordered. Thank you, Florence. A UCL graduate. <laughs> um, it's extremely organized. It's terrifying because it is not a chaotic slaughter. It is the governance of life. It is a mechanism of governance, not purely of extermination. And the claim that Agamben would make is that Zattery Camp is doing exactly the same thing. And this is where the distinction between a way of life and bare life becomes very important. So in Zattery Camp in Jordan, you can live. You will have a shipping container for your family. But you cannot work. You will get your ration. You don't have freedom to leave the camp. You won't get permission from the Jordanian government. And so your life your prospects, your hopes, have been so severely constrained that you are almost simply existing. And your life expectancy is good in Zattery Camp. It's, not a, it's reasonably secure. There isn't epidemic infectious disease. There isn't chronic malnutrition. There are none of the problems that beset old-fashioned humanitarian efforts. This is a modern, well-organized camp. And yet, there is something horrific about the constraining of tens or hundreds of thousands of people in this way. And we can see that's another camp. Um, and we can see that, there you go. So you get an idea of the ordered, you know, calm, peaceful, but utterly constrained life. There is no way of life in Zattery camp. Uh, we'll come back to these pictures, actually. This is a picture of a camp in Burma that I worked in. 
And again, you see a very orderly camp. Nice camp. It's very small. It's been put on a football pitch, not in the school. The school is at the bottom of the build. Uh, the, those buildings at the bottom of the school. They haven't put the, refu- uh, the displaced people in the school, which they could easily have done. They haven't had to close the school. They've actually kept that open, used the football pitch. So that's good. Everyone's where they should be. It's well organised. There's a map. The latrines are separate. It's a lovely camp. It's not too big. The only problem is it's run by the Burmese government, who at this point were a military hunter who were not treating their population nice at all. So here you see quite a direct confusion between a displaced persons camp, which is meant to be a place of safety and refuge, supporting people's existence, and a concentration camp run by an abusive government. But these two things begin to overlap. Another picture um, of a camp I worked in in Burma, and you can see British flags on the Burmese government's camp. We sent them all the aid, they confiscated it, but they ran the camps as well as we would have done. And yet, they are an oppressive government, and they were keeping an eye on everyone, and people were disappearing from those camps. This is the biggest camp in the world. Does anyone know where this is? It's Dadaab in Kenya. And at one point, it doesn't have a million people anymore, but at one point it was the third largest city in Kenya. In Dadaab, they use biometric identification for the people uh, who are there. So if you're registered in Dadaab, that's how you get your ration. Now, biometric registration is very, very expensive. You need a large, you need all those fancy scanners that they have in the airports in America. Um, you, you, need, you need a big, you just need a load of admin and software and all, all kinds of things to do it. The reason that we do that is that if you can get to Europe from Somalia, you have a de facto refugee status, pretty much. Somalia is such a bad place to be that we kind of go, yeah, if you can prove you're a Somali, we'll let you in and give you asylum, unless your fingerprints are in that database in which case you do not meet the refugee convention criteria. You do not have a well-founded fear of persecution, which is what the law requires you to have. Instead, you're just trying to upgrade from not a very nice place of safety to a better place of safety like Europe, so we can send you back. So our view of Dadaab, one of the largest humanitarian operations in history, we could view it as a place where many lives are saved, where many people are fed and housed and kept safe from violence in Somalia, Eritrea. Or we could view it as a massive containment camp to prevent people coming to Europe or to exclude them from Europe once they get here. Very strange reworking of that humanitarian idea. It feels a lot less humanitarian once you start to dig into it. So all those pictures I showed you at the beginning of the camp in Calais have a very weird element to it because those conditions were appalling. And when we went to look, um, if you you remember how disgusting they were, these people living in tents, in filth, in freezing conditions. We we interviewed, for the documentary we were making, we interviewed a guy who had a PhD in public health from Cambridge, and he was working at Cambridge as a postdoc, and he left his postdoc to come and um, uh, work in the camp. And he was wildly angry about the conditions that the French government were forcing people to live under. And he was, you know, he was an extremely bright guy, and he knew all the public health measures that should be taken, and he listed them all very helpfully for the camera, which is great. We have this, you know, academic from Cambridge says, this is terrible, that gives it the BBC like that. And yet, (laughs) right next door to the camp, available to everyone in that camp, the French government had built the perfect camp. It's right there, you can see it. So this is, um, this is, it's on gravel, it's drained, there are clean latrines, heated shipping containers with electricity, a fence around it for security, loads and loads and loads of kids being trafficked out of those camps, lots of women being abducted, I mean really horrible stuff going on, badly lit, dangerous places to be at night. So these shipping containers made excellent sense and all you needed was to give your fingerprints up which you were assured, you, you, I, I believe the French people who told us, but I'm not sure the refugees did, that they would not be put into a central database. It was just a fingerprint to unlock the door. You didn't have to give a name, you didn't have to show any ID. You just had to register with something, with a fingerprint and some kind of name, just to say um, who you were. And then you got your shipping container and your family could move in there, the prioritised families, and then you'd be safe and warm and you wouldn't be abducted or trafficked out of there and um, you wouldn't get horrible infectious disease and there weren't rats running everywhere and so on. And no one had moved in there for two reasons, and everyone we asked gave the same two reasons. The first was the opportunity to get to the UK. It's really hard now to get to the UK from Calais. There are still people trying. But the method is that you have to get on a truck. And has anyone been to Calais recently? I mean, just for miles out of town, 
the motorways are surrounded by 20 foot high white fences, spotlights and barbed wire. I mean, it, it, is, it is like, I don't know, what some terrible dystopian movie. It's very peculiar. And you see globalization pouring past on the highway and people living, living next to the highway. I've got, I'll show you some pictures in a minute. Um, so if you want to get on a truck, you've got to walk or get a taxi or get a bus, depending on what you can afford, miles out of Calais to a place where you can get to a truck stop. You then have to either get on a truck that's going in the right direction. You have to go, figure out it's going to England because it's got the steering wheel on the right side. It's got British license plate. But it might be going, might, you might get in the truck and wake up in Germany, in which case you'll have to get a bus back to France. You still do it. You're still in Schengen. You can do it. But it's all money. It's all headache. And it's all time. So from the moment you leave your, your tent in Calais or, or, or Dunkirk, the moment you get back to it from an attempt to get into the UK, you've probably been a couple of 50, 50, 60 miles um, in a truck, tens of miles on foot. You might have been arrested and beaten up by the police. You might have had to go to hospital. You might have ended up in another country. All so it can easily take a week to do an attempt. It certainly take more than 48 hours. 48 hours, you lose your shipping container. So the French, and not unreasonably, the French said, why would we pay for a shipping container for you when you're not going to use it? You're off just trying to get out of France. Be in France, and we'll let you have a shipping container. And the other reason was that you couldn't cook in the shipping containers. They didn't want, um, they didn't want fires, and everyone wanted to eat their own food. There are nine or ten different nationalities represented in that camp, do predominantly. So S Syrians mostly, Iraqis, Iranians, Afghanis, um, Sudanese, I'm not going to be able to do it, Levin, uh, Afghanis, but I, I probably won't get to nine. But anyway, there were a decent, decent number of different nationalities. Everyone wanted to eat their own food. So you can see this extraordinary choice between Zoi and Bios. Zoi being existence and Bios being that way of life, those two Greek words, bare life and a way of life. And everyone chose a way of life, which is terrifying if you work in public health, you work in the health sciences, that actually people choose hope and opportunity over moment-to-moment -moment safety and security. It, 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 when you were there, it felt like almost everyone. And the only people who weren't, who weren't doing that were people who, who ha were in genuine danger of being beaten up immediately in the near future. So you get this very, very stark contrast. Um, I'll leave you, this is, this, is the, um, this is one of the pictures, this is everyone being CS gassed in the evening. Um, the French police lined up along this, uh, I don't know if you can see the, have I got a laser? Maybe I don't have a laser. Anyway, you can see the fence in the background, that road going to the port and the detritus of the camp uh, in the foreground. Everyone um, kind of huddled around the campfire at night. So I'll, I'll show you a couple more, I'll just show you a couple more pictures. Um, from the, from the journey, this very strange journey. People got off these boats in Greece, and they're, not, they're, not, they're in Europe, but they're nowhere near where they want to be, which is Germany or Sweden or the UK. Um, and these very peculiar interactions, once you're in Europe, you, you, it's easier to be culturally sensitive when you're overseas, but in Europe, you're not quite sure what to do. So people have brought loads of toys. So I handed this little girl who'd had terrible hypothermia, she was unconscious when she came in, she perked up, she's so cute. And well, no, one of the nurses, American nurse, brought her in a Barbie doll. And I thought, oh, I, I don't like the idea of Barbie anyway. You know, that's not sort of, doesn't feel quite right nowadays. Um, and handing this little girl from Syria, who I assumed was Muslim, you know, probably her father was quite orthodox. And he was sort of standing there. I thought, oh, what are we doing? This is all, all my kind of liberal London progressive, <laughs> you know, oh, Bob, what's it doing? Gender norms, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, maybe he's doing gender neutral parenting in Syria. So, and he was... You can see him here. He was so happy that his little girl had a toy. He was in tears. This idea, and I had all these weird calculations that you, 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 as, soon as, you as, soon as, as soon as we'd done it, it became obvious. His little girl didn't have any property in the world, and neither did he. That this Barbie doll was the, the best thing that had happened to them that day, for sure. He'd almost lost her. This is a, a, a man, um, uh, just, just one more example. Um, uh, this is a, a guy called Kasai. And Kasai has osteogenesis imperfecta. I don't know if anyone knows anyone with osteogenesis imperfecta, but he had a version that was very severe. He was a dissident in Syria. He was confined to his bed, wheelchair bound, um, uh, power, power off for most of the day. And so he's in his apartment with his sister or mum dropping in to look after him once a day. So he eats once a day. If, if that, there were several days when he was completely abandoned and writing aggressive Facebook posts about the Syrian regime and about ISIS on his Facebook page. So a dissident when he had electricity from his bedroom, unable to leave. Um, a, a life, still some sort of existence, but a pre, almost bare life in Syria. 
Um, his cousin managed to wheel him out of Syria to Turkey, um, not wheel him all the way, they got a taxi and things, but I mean in his wheelchair, got him to the Turkish coast. They bought two seats, one for his wheelchair, one for him. The smugglers chucked his wheelchair in the ocean. In the bottom of those boats, there is about a meter of water. The bottom sags out, they're not good rafts at all. So um, he sunk up to his neck. And this is a guy, with, you can see his chest anatomy is deformed, he, he's not well. Um, barely able to breathe, freezing cold, for about six hours in the, um, in the med, in, or in the Aegean in, in, um, in winter. Um, he broke but radius and ulna bilaterally, humerus bilaterally, both femurs, um, tib and fib bilaterally, so broken arms, broken legs, uh, nine broken ribs, cracked spine, cracked skull, by the time he got off the boat with everyone jostling and everyone panicking. Um, MSF had got him into a hospital. And uh, at this point, he was, in, he was in Athens when I met him. And he is now in Holland, where he is a senior person in the major Dutch osteogenesis imperfecta society. And his job is translating medical journals from Arabic to English and vice versa. So he has gone from being an incapacitated person to a productive tax-paying member of the, Dutch, of, 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 of the Dutch economy. Regardless of our ethical obligations, that seems to me to be a, a remarkable story of, of possibly why we should be uh, friendly to refugees. An extremely human tale, and I'd like to thank you very much for coming to UCL and telling it. Thank you very thank much. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.